15, I guess we're lead off matters for, for all the sessions here today. Uh, my name is Larry Stackle, I'm extension lead specialist with the University of Tennessee. I think I know most of folks in this room. So, uh, if you, if you, if you. Garrett and I, Garrett Montgomery, he's working on a PhD with us right now. Um, I don't know the answer, he doesn't know the answer, which could be very likely. Uh, uh, there's some folks in here to do. I will also mention Garrett's going through his prelims next month. <laughs> so any hard questions you got, that's who we'll direct you to. <laughs> you never know what's going to come up in the prelims. I think I got most of mine wrong, except I do the NASCAR make drivers, NASCAR drivers. That actually came up my prelim. <laughs> that's about the only thing I didn't know. Uh, it seemed like it's time. So I'm going to go through some stuff, and a lot of y'all, guys, you're living it every day. So you're going through a lot of this stuff. And maybe bring some light to some of what we're doing, where we're going, and how we're going to get there uh, going in the future. Um, 2015, uh, particularly in Tennessee, but I think we can say it for a lot of the mid south, we took a big step backwards on Palmer Pickwick management. Now, in cotton, actually, we actually did a little bit better job, I think, in part because we had a lot less acres, so it was easier to tend them uh, timely. Um, and for the fact that basically all our varieties need more keep spray liberty over the top of it. And everybody used that as a backstop. But in soybeans, we took a big step backwards. And there was a number of reasons for that. Uh, going forward, because you know, we're managing with a lot of these contact herbicides. Um, but one of the big ones that really came to light was the PPO resistance. And back in 2001, of all things, it was first documented in Waterham, which is Palmer Pigweed's really close cousin. Uh, in Kansas, of all places, I never think of Kansas, they grow soybeans in Kansas, but apparently they do. And that's the first place they, they found it. Uh, in 2010, they found it in East States, Illinois. And Dr. Pat Trannell up at the University of Illinois, he, he gave this talk, he gave me these, these couple of these slides to kind of highlight this, that they were first seeing resistance there. And he developed a molecular test at the time, funded by actually the Illinois Soybean Checkoff Dollars, uh, to be able to assess um, if, if the gene is there for the PPO resistance in water at the time. And I'll, I'll never forget when I was sitting in on his talk, this was the symptomology he was showing on the water him uh, back then. And when you spray a Flexstar or a Blazer or a Cobra over this PPO resistant water hemp, you don't burn every leaf off. I think we've all seen when we're, when we're spraying Flexstar on pigweed and it's a little too big, we've all done it. You burn every leaf off and you get lateral growth from those little lower ones down low. That's not the case with this PPO resistant water hamper in, or palmer pigweed. Uh, you don't burn every leaf off. You model them a little bit or fleck the leaves just a little bit. Um, leaves typically hang in there and the new growth comes right out of the apical mare stem and never checks up. You don't always see this, but a lot of times you will see it in these fields you walk into. So I started walking in some fields this past year where folks, uh, you know, like this field, it had two ounces of valor, it got activated. That pig we blew through it in about 10 days. Uh, they put a pint and a half of flex star and a quarter roundup on it, and I took this picture two weeks later. Uh, it was just, just rolling through it. But what really got me concerned, because you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. Bad coverage, uh, rain shortly afterwards, all that kind of thing. But I started seeing symptomology like this on the Palmer pigweed. It looked a lot like the water him. I thought, oh boy, uh, this sure looks like PPO resistance. So we sent some leaf samples off up to Dr. Pat Trannell, and he ran his molecular test, and sure enough, the resistance gene that's is present in water nymph was also found in this Palmer pig. And we were seeing it in a lot of fields um, across West Tennessee, uh, Arkansas, and talking to Jason Bond, Mississippi now too. Um, and pretty widespread, I probably at least three counties, if not four. If not four. Okay. That's it. And I know as far north as Kentucky, Mountain County, Kentucky, which is where the Ohio and dumps into the Mississippi. And uh, now a good piece in the Mississippi. So it's showing up a lot of places. This is kind of the symptomology you see. This is one of the more classic symptomology that you see where it kind of models those leaves and that new growth comes out, comes out green. There's another picture. I don't read too many pictures of these. These are what the fields were looking like. Uh, very, very resemblance to what we saw when we lost Roundup back in, in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, where folks were spraying things timely and still not controlling them. Um, 
this is one of the fields we did the most work on. Uh, here's your next speaker uh, out way through it. Um, this is in, actually on right on the Shelby Tipton County line, just north of here, 25 minutes probably. Um, and we did a lot of work in this field. And I said we, I should say that loosely. Garrett did a lot of work in this field. Uh, he did a lot of spraying and actually Julie did too. Right now, this is this is what we know as far as counties. This actually isn't quite up to date anymore. Uh, but we got five counties in, in Tennessee uh, that we've confirmed it in here: Shelby County, uh, Tipton, Lauderdale, Gibson, and Crockett counties. Uh, there's 12 or 13 down in Arkansas. I believe these ones here, right, but uh, right against like Mississippi County. I think that one's got added. And Bobby, y'all. <coughs> He's right in here, right? Yeah, right in there. We got it as far south as Sunflower. It's Sunflower. That's almost down to Greenville, then, right? That's that long county. That's district. this one here? Yep. yep. It is. Nice. What this tells me with this big <coughs> rapid spread is this didn't happen this past year. <laughs> this is about a third year process, and we're finally got enough looking at it that we can tell that it's actually resistance. It didn't get spread over four states in one year. This is this has been an ongoing process over the last couple of three years. Uh, Hello. Yes. I've seen this graph go five couple times, but where are we? In Jackson, Louisiana, you know, it doesn't. Are we saying it's not there or? No. Um, good question. Well, uh, Daniel Stevens has been. In fact, Pat Trammell's had more work than what he's ever wanted to do. Uh, they have sent samples off to Florida, um, Louisiana. I don't know if they've done much in Missouri yet. Uh, they started in Kentucky. Pat will tell you, because um, I've sent a lot of samples off to him too, he gets a lot of false negatives with Palmer. <coughs> that, his test is really dialed in real well for water hemp. It's not as dialed in for Palmer pigweed. So he's confident a lot of the samples he's getting in are resistant, but his test, because it's a pretty, it's a tricky test, um, isn't showing it. In fact, he's He's developing it now for Palmer Pigweed. He thought he'd have it in about three months to where it would be right on all the time. He's confident a big portion of the samples sent in were. And like Jason Bond sent a bunch of samples into it, they came back negative. The stuff we sent was negative, and then we just grew them out of the greenhouse and, and they're positive. They yeah, out. yeah. But you might even say that Bobby, what, what y'all did. But. So the, the stuff Jason sent up to Trammell, you know, was was negative. Or resistance, and then we grew them in the greenhouse, or Jason's crew grew them out of the greenhouse. Actually, VJ did it across the tracks and uh, sprayed them, and they didn't die. So, yeah, he, he, they had a slightly different appearance too than, than what the ones that Travels test is tested positive for. Uh, what do you like. wonder? Does that mean that the Travel test was, was a, a false negative, or is it a different? He's, he said that too. I mean, we may very well be dealing with more than one mechanism of resistance. Um, with this PPO resistance. I wouldn't be at all surprised. And, and don't they think they've got it out east as well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you talked to Alan York in North Carolina. They're fairly confident they got it there. So this is a pretty widespread deal uh, across <laughs> all of us now. Um, and it, really, just for the last month, it seemed like. Yeah, well, we really worked in Knoxville. Uh, well, we're doing a bunch of screening in Knoxville, but as far as developing a test, we've been leaving that to Pat Trammell. He's way ahead of everybody on it. He doesn't have that far to go, so, yeah. All right, you talk about foliar applications. Is any, are you seeing anything with the pre-emerge stuff? <coughs> I mean, is the pre-emerge valor, I mean, it's going to be anything resistant there? Uh, good question. I'm going to get to that in uh, just a minute, but yeah, it, uh, that's the big question. So what we know on all these is the post-apply PPO herbicides are, are basically swinging and missing. Uh, right now, of course, Anthony, you bring up another good point. It may be another resistance mechanism, but the one we're finding in Arkansas, and, you know, today, it's been the same resistance mechanism as uh, found in water hemp. Uh, in a few fields we looked at, and actually, we're, Garrett and Julie did a lot of spraying, uh, about 20% or a little better of the population is resistant. So it, it, it's obviously been there. What we don't know, and this is, is, is will the pre-applied PPOs, um, are they still gonna give us some pretty good traction on this resistant polymer pigweed? If you look at water hemp, they've done a fair amount of work on it. 
They do give some residual control, but the length of residual is cut about half, if you look at it. Uh, and we're starting to do some of that here. Um, I don't know how many of y'all doing some stuff. I know like Tom Barber is in Arkansas. I'm not, I'm not sure what yeah. all VJA is doing. Uh, VJA is running most of it. Tom Mueller's doing some for us. He's actually got a graduate student on it. Uh, Jason Yorsworthy came out with his first run, and this is some of his data uh, he sent me. So he's got a susceptible population here. Uh, he's got a resistant one from Gregory County and a resistant one from Crittenden County. And so this is with uh, Reflex. And so this is a pint rate. So we got 100% control 10 days after application with a pint or a Reflex on the, on the susceptible. We, within 10 days, we've got almost 30% of this population has broke through it, and over 50% of this population has broke through it. Um, so we've lost a lot of utility out of these PPO herbicides. It's a little variable. Vomesifen's the worst. Uh, reflex. Here's Valor. Um, same trend, but they're a little bit better controlled by 1x. The thing that's interesting to me is you go up to 2x, in case you know, in this case it's 4 ounces of Valor. It didn't make any difference. Um, even up in the rate. I, I thought that was interesting, and that's been, been consistent. Uh, so Venture Zone, I don't have that slide here. Um, it's it's right in here with Valor, uh, same type situation. So, uh, so this is greenhouse work? This is greenhouse work, yeah. So we're doing some, I know Tom's got greenhouses full in Arkansas, uh, doing some more of this, so we're trying to get to the bottom as quick as we can. Uh, you, know, you talk to the folks up in the Midwest, and and I drove through a lot of Illinois this, this past year when Farm Progress showing stuff. I've never seen pigweed like I've, I've seen in Southern Illinois this past year. And they've got PPO resistance. It's a way alive. But <coughs> if you look at those fields, they got a lot of water hemp in them. Water hemp's not as competitive as Palmer pigweed. And, and they wouldn't harvest some of those fields if it was Palmer pigweed. So I think they're able to live with it better than what we can. Okay, I'm going to switch it over to Garrett. And have it, he's going to go through some, some of the management and some of the stuff he's doing. Uh, like Dr. Stewart said, I'm Gary Montgomery. So I'm uh, his PhD student, and he was lying about what my prelim were. <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, we've been talking about this PPO resistance, and, uh, you know, if you think about it, the herbicide resistance is not a new phenomenon. We've been having that going on since the late 80s. and. You know, every, it seems like every time we start really overutilizing something that it's going to break eventually. I mean, it's a, just a biological process and, you know, we had the DNA herbicides in the late 80s, we had the ALSs in the mid 90s, and then in 2005 we had glyphosate resistance and 2008 we had atrazine resistance and now we're into PPO resistance. So we, we've been running into this type thing and we've been looking at it and this year we got the PPO herbicides like we were talking about. <coughs> and, uh, so the University of Illinois turned out this study last year where they um, took it was a herd of fields, it was a couple hundred site years worth of data where they had all the management strategies that they'd use in every one of these fields and uh, they, used, they looked at number of herbicides, uh, number of modes of action per application, uh, herbicide programs per year, tillage practices, row spacing, um, if you read over it, it was almost everything you could imagine. And they were looking to see um, what was the best predictor of glyphosate resistant uh, water hemp. So out of, it was like 66 variables, management practices were the best predictor. So management practices, uh, changing crops, uh, cultural type practices. But uh, one of the big things from it was that uh, number, of modes of number of modes of action per application were more predictive than number of modes of action per year. So uh, using two and a half modes of action, uh, an average of two and a half modes of action, that'd be like a two modes of action and three modes of action in two separate applications, we're 83 times less likely to have glyphosate resistant water hemp than one and a half modes of, a modes of action per application. And uh, this just pointed out how we're gonna have to have some alternative management uh, practices to continue to be effective and well, really where we are, we're gonna need to increase our effectiveness to uh, be successful. Yes, sir. Question about that. Um, one of the things that study said was that the simple, the simple AI rotations actually increase resistance. Mm -hmm. At least I, I read that, but in, in reference to what? You know, that, in other words, we tend to think it's a good idea to rotate those of action, right? Right. <coughs> but what did, what did the 
study really say about you know using single AIs in rotation relative to resistance? I don't remember. It's been a while since I've read that one. I'm just let's see if that should happen. But um, one is, I think I remember they were talking about using you know some set soybean herbicide program alternated with a set corn herbicide program repetitively. So it was a small number of active ingredients per you know per year for application that they were using successfully every other I mean, successively every other year. So the reason I'm asking the question is I think we hear a lot of rhetoric about this about rotating, but my question is this study seemed to indicate that a simple rotation of AIs is not adequate to manage resistance. That significant factors when you use them within the same application in multiple modes of action, which is what you said there. Right. Um, does that make sense what I'm asking? Because well, I mean, there's that, a lot of rhetoric about just simple rotating modes of action and including multiple modes of action, but if, if they're not used simultaneously, that study seemed to indicate that there's some risk of resistance. Well, and that's, that's where we We've actually had conversations before about how it would be hard to recommend Liberty without a PPO for that specific reason. I mean, even if you're in PPO resistance, and it, even if it's only, you know, even if it, the PPO is not going to help you on 20% of the population, that means on 80% of the population, you're taking some of the pressure off of it. We're going to, uh, that's actually what a lot of the end of this talk is about, is how we're going to do something. I mean, we're going to use as many herbicides as we can going to implement that in as many more things as we can to try to make it, to try to keep staying ahead of what we're doing. But the new herbicide programs that we're really talking about here are the Roundup Ready Extend and, uh, and less weed control technology. So just talking about cotton, we, uh, the Roundup Ready Extend has dicamba, glufosinate, glyphosate tolerance, and uh, Enlist has 2,4-D, choline, glufosinate, and glyphosate tolerance. Uh, just in a slide, what they won't do, uh, they're not going to be a silver bullet. They're not going to be like life say was, and I don't think any of us think that's going to happen. You know, you're not going to go through there and spray six foot tall big weeds with it and expect them to go away. But uh, what they do is they bring us another mode of action that we can use. So they give us another option uh, to where right now in some situations we're extremely limited on what we can use to kill something, to kill big weeds post. This brings us something else to the table that we can use. And uh, this just kind of captures the point that we were talking about. So this is a half a pound of dicamba 12 days after on a 8 to 12 inch palmer pigweed, uh, 24 days after treatment, whenever it really matters, we're not that successful with it. And it's a very similar story when you're looking at 248. But whenever we look at comparing that, um, add the liberty together, so it just kind of brings home the point that we were talking about. One, one mode of action or any of those other four <coughs> with one mode of action compared to two effective modes of action at the same time. And uh, you get the same type of effect whether we're, no matter which technology we're talking about. And, uh, this is just the data slide from that. Um, whenever we use higher rates, we get more control with 2,4-D or um, dicamba, and uh, we get increased control with either one of them whenever we add glufosinate into that mix. So uh, one of the other things that we're going to be talking about, and we're not going to, in this talk, we're not going to go into the specific label requirements or anything like that, but what's going to also come away in life is uh, talking about nozzles. It's not going to be as simple as going out and spraying anymore. You're going to have to have a specific <laughs> nozzle, and that specific nozzle is going to affect a lot of the things you do, and we're trying to figure out how it affects a lot of the herbicides that we're used to using. So uh, almost anything can affect crop size whenever you really get down and look at it. And uh, just as a general rule, contact herbicides are more effective than systemic. And uh, we're also doing a lot of work looking at rate control systems. So not all rate control systems are the same. You have certain systems that um, increase or decrease pressure depending on your speed. You have a pulse width modulation system that uh, holds some X pressure and uh, pulses faster and faster to drive. Uh, we actually have a small sprayer where we can do that. And then we also did one test this year with a full-size case Patriot where we were looking at that type of thing. So uh, for looking at Palmer control, this was on about 
six inch Palmer Amaranth. Uh, we're using <coughs> Liberty and Dual, and we were using our sprayer, and we took each one of the tips across the bottom, and we ran it. All of the pressures were somewhere around 40 PSI, depending on how close we can hold it, but we were looking at a the 50% pulse on pulse width modulation compared to a constant flow, so just pressure regulated. And uh, just for reference, the DR nozzle and the ER nozzle, it's a Wilger DR and ER. The Wilger DR is something similar, puts a droplet size, something similar to an AIXR. The ER is something similar to a flat fan. Uh, those, but those nozzles are made to go on pulse width modulation system. So we had them in there just to compare to see how they do in a constant flow versus a pulse width modulator, but with the AIXR, we lost some control using the pulse width modulation. Uh, we actually found out some people would say you, you can't run an AI nozzle on a pulse width modulation, and actually it'll physically work. It just won't give you the efficacy that you were going to have. <coughs> and right when you turn it on, it's going to spray everywhere. It won't stay out of the way of it. But, uh, but we also, with that being said, even with the Wilger DR and ER, we lost a little bit of control, not quite as much as we did with the AI nozzle. We looked at a green leaf um, dual fan. We actually had a pretty significant loss of control using the dual fan without the AI, but um, we're not 100% sure. We're not as confident on that one where we pulled the AI nozzle, the AI cap off there. We couldn't get the PSI high enough on the sprayer because our, our sprayer pump's just not that good. and. Um, so like I said, we looked at the same type of test on a large scale sprayer. We had uh, three different types of the Wilger no nozzle combinations. The Y sprays frontwards and backwards. The, these two are different um, combinations of nozzles on that pulse width modulating with um, one pulse in the front and one staying constant in the back and then compared to an AIXR or a TTI. And, um, the Y gave us the best control. It also had the smallest droplet. It was a uh, really followed the trend we kind of expected. Smaller droplets was effectively gave us the most coverage. We got the most control on Palmer Amaranth. Um, the Wilger system did as good as any, as the AIXR, which we kind of consider our standard. That's what we have the majority of our guys using. Uh, but you can get as good as you can with the AIXR system using the Wilger system, and then we had the lowest control with. Uh, large drop in size. Yes, sir. Is that with aim command or without? Um, aim command, aim command, and aim command, and these were without. So we had the uh, AI, XR, and the TTI were on a set pressure, and they were all on a set pressure. And uh, <coughs> the combo, the Y and the blended, the aim command was set to pull at a specific pressure. Results. Did you do the Y with, with no aim command, or did you tell the aim command help? Or? We we did it just with the aim command, or just with the pulse width modulation on, or off of there. Uh, so, kind of bring all that to a head. We start talking about some of the old technologies. Uh, there's certain tillage regiments you can use in weed control, but in Tennessee, in general, that's not our best option. We have rolling topography. Uh, we have large adoption of no-till, there's a reason for that. Our guys are effective with it. It fits our area pretty well, but uh, we have been looking at cover crops. So cover crops will let you maintain your no-till. They give you an extra, um, give you an extra tool for managing weeds if they're managed effectively. And uh, one of the biggest things with cover crops is uh, getting biomass. So you need a high biomass cover crop. Uh, the short, the higher the biomass you have, the more weed suppression you're gonna have. And we're looking at uh, mixtures of these cover crops. But whenever you start talking about a cover crop, there's a million questions, there's a million theories about what you could do without the people will put out there without having something to back it up with. And uh, this is actually a picture from Stanley Culpepper. You can see that he's got, you know, a rock cover crop that's six feet tall, it's taller than a guy on the tractor. And they use a roller crimper. We looked into that a little bit in Tennessee, but uh, so some of the big things we're looking at with weed management cover crop research is we're focusing on a smaller number of species, try to get good at what we're doing and get something figured out all the way to where we can give somebody a compliment or a confident recommendation on it. This is everything that we have looked at, but as a general rule, I would say we're looking at cereal rye, wheat, veg, and crimson clover the majority of the time. That's, uh, that's what we're having the most luck with and that's what we're continuing to look at the closest. And, uh, Really, the focus of my dissertation is on 
timing and method of termination for cover crops. So we're trying to see how late we can wait to terminate. The later you wait, the more biomass you get, the more weed suppression you get, but we don't want to negatively impact our crop whenever we do that. So I spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, like I said, this is the main ones we're looking at. This is the plant rates that we're using for each of them. For now, whenever we talk about planting a mix, what we mean is we planted <coughs> now and then came back and planted the next. Just because that's with our small planter, that's more simple for us to do. But uh, one of the big things is that it needs to be managed crop specifically, like a pre-herbicide. You wouldn't put just any pre down in front of just any crop and expect it to work and expect the crop to have no negative impact. So the cover crop's gonna have to be thought of the same way. So um, like a crop like soybean or something, we might go with um, cereal rye and hairy veg, something that will get five feet tall and expect to plant straight into it and have our beans still do very well. Uh, something like cotton, it's not as tough right when it comes out of the ground, we probably wouldn't expect to do that. We'd probably be looking more at doing just hairy veg. Hairy veg fixes nitrogen, it doesn't have quite the biomass, it's a little bit more user friendly for cotton to come up through. And uh, it's just some things you're gonna have to have to consider if you're going to put out one. So like we were talking about with biomass being essential, uh, whenever we use cereal rye or wheat in combination with one of our legume species, we're getting significantly increased biomass, especially over the, just the legumes by itself, just <coughs> right that point home. We're using, one of our favorite combinations is, um, like I said, wheat or rye with hairy veg, uh, not specifically for cotton, but if you're looking at soybeans, we get, we have very good results out of that. It grows up, tangles up, we can plant into it, it looks a lot like that roller creeper picture just for the plant. But, uh, so some of the extra things we're looking at is um, cover crops and winter weeds. So look at the uh, no cover plot, we have um, some embed, some poa, a couple of different things growing. And just in our cereal rye plot that was just had periquat at planting, we have no winter weeds in it. But we are getting um, questions about it. We're seeing issues or we're seeing things come up with it. And the biggest weeds that we're looking at with this is um, Italian ryegrass and horseweed. Actually, Dr. Bond in the back right there helped me out with it a little bit. I kind of stole some ideas from, that he had whenever I was down there working for him. But with horseweed, one of the biggest things that we've noticed is using paraquat when you plant your cover crop. We get, we haven't uh, had a test side by side where we can count it, quantify it, put a graph up, but we're seeing a significant reduction you know, just by eyeballing it, just making sure that you're planting into a clean ground whenever you plant your cover crop. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. And um, so this is uh, just hairy veg where we were planting cotton into it. And this is plants per acre that we looked at. No cover, no herbicide. That was just how many, that was just our population. That was what we had in the area. If you look at just a cover, that's about a 95% reduction in plants just by having a cover crop. Uh, if you used a Roundup Valor termination, for, and this is dead planting, 14 days ahead of planting, we got it down a little bit more, and each of those was uh, significantly better than Paraquat alone, even though that, that wouldn't be something that we would recommend just for horse weed, that was just kind of there as a comparison. We all have a pretty good feel for how that looks. Uh, this was the area, and you can see in the bench, we just, bench really outcompeted the horse weed. Uh, cultural way to beat it and uh, so this is the some of the data I was talking about where we're looking at cover crops and fall plot herbicides for Italian ryegrass control so uh, this is looking at wheat and hairy veg we have a couple of more crop cover crops in there that we're using but uh, this is just for practical purposes trying to keep it simple uh, this injury 90 days after treatment we have uh, Valor and Prowl that we put down pre and then Warrant defined Metribuzin, Zidua, and Dual that we put down post that was at a one leaf stage cover crop. So basically, we waited as soon as it got out of the ground and sprayed it, trying to put it out as early as we could, beat all the weeds. Um, weed, we didn't have a lot of difference in injury. It was all about 10% injury. Um, late in the year, Dr. Bond had some injury come up that got worse, and late in the year, our grew out of it. So we're doing this again. We're going to uh, Get, get a little bit more data together before we start really trying to make a recommendation. <coughs> but we're looking at this. And then with Vetch, we had a lot of injury out of Valor, a lot of injury out of Metropolitan, which is 
kind of what we would expect out of that situation. Um, as far yeah, as control, what, yes. What growth state was the post application flood? Uh, one leaf wheat and cattle leaf and batch. Um, so this is ryegrass control for wheat. We didn't have an interaction of cover and no cover. So all these plots, we apply the herbicide at the same time as no cover and also a cover so we can compare results. Um, we got the greatest control in wheat with peroxy cell phone and um, dual. And we had a significant increase in our cover or in our ryegrass control with a cover crop compared to no cover. Uh, with cover and a residual applied, you get up above 90% control and you started having a program that was pretty effective. Uh, majority of the stuff we're looking at struggling to uh, control the ryegrass populations that we have it put under. With veg, the results were a little bit more variable. Uh, we just didn't have quite, quite as good control. It was still pretty close with veg, with uh, cereal, or, I mean with uh, Italian ryegrass. Again, it's a legume, it's fixing nitrogen, it's not, um, not as conducive to suppressing it. Uh, but we still had the same two herbicides at the top of the list for doing good. Um, solid injury slides, we're still trying to get a little bit better feel for that. We actually have a lot more side years of it this year so that we can try to get our minds wrapped around it better. So, in short, some of the benefits we're looking at. Uh, plant a cover crop, one of the big things is it's going to take out your um, early spring or late fall herbicide application. You're going to plant it. We said we'd prefer to see it from oxone, be clean. And then you don't have to mess with it again until right at plant. Uh, then we're going to find it. We're going to talk about some ways that we're terminating it. Uh, we have seen increase in insect pressure, specifically uh, three cornered alfalfa hoppers and beans. Um, there's been some stuff on. How did this stuff work out with the thrips and cotton? Thrips actually helps. Yeah. It does? Yeah, it helps. And uh, worms in general, yeah, we have an increase yeah. in. Uh, so that's just something to watch out for if that's what you, if you're using these. So the way we're looking at combining them is uh, 24D and dicamba both really increase the control of the legume cover crop <coughs> on carry veg or crimson clover over glyphosate alone. And uh, they allow you more flexibility on your termination timing. Like we said, the longer you wait, the more biomass you get, the more weed suppression you get. Uh, so it just increases your flexibility. And uh, this was a test that we did a couple of years ago in soybeans. This was smooth pigweed, it's at the Milo Experiment Station. But we terminated either 21, 14 days before planting, uh, at planting, seven days after planting, or 14 days after planting. So we planted straight into veg, and some of the plots we didn't term terminate the cover crop until two weeks after planting using uh, Roundup and Dicamba on extend beans. And this is the number of days from planting until we had to go in there and apply a cleanup application at a four inch smooth pickle. So with the 14 days after planting, we never had to apply that. So we kind of thought we were on to something, but as Dr. Sterk would say, it's smooth pickle and some minor leaks. We uh, took that same test to Jackson where we had research grade Palmer Amaranth. We didn't have quite the same results, but we still got a little bit of an increase by being able to delay your, um, delay your termination <coughs> time. So we turned around and did the same test in cotton. This is a, 35 days after planting rate, we had that same kind of trend from the 14 days before to the 14 days after planting. We had a decrease in control. Um, we had the, the cleanup application on this one was put down about 14 days later, so about 50 days into the season. This wasn't the highest pop Palmer Emirate population, but at the end of the year, we were able to get them all cleaned up. Um, we didn't have a significant impact of yield. We all had about two and a half bales of cotton out there, so we could still, we could delay. The short of it, what we found is we could delay the termination timing in, uh, in our cover crop in cotton and still maintain our yield and still maintain our weed control uh, in these new technology systems. Uh, some of the things to watch out for, some of the things I've seen with it, it'll destroy <coughs> any hole. So if any hole in your stand uh, could be something to keep your eye on, it'll exploit any hole that you have. This is especially true with uh, legume species. Uh, so Do uh, Matthew Wiggins, Dr. Matthew Wiggins now, was a graduate student before me. And this is some of his work. He's looking at putting a pre-herbicide with a cover crop. You got significantly better control, uh, significantly better control with uh, either Warrant or uh, Cotteran applied pre on cover crop species in comparison to the no herbicide. 
uh, significantly better yield, more weed control, and better crop protection. So uh, in conclusion, neither one of our new herbs herbicide technologies are going to be a silver bullet, but they're going to be uh, extremely helpful. We're going to need to incorporate those, you know, into a sound management system. We're not going to need to just take, expect that new mode of action or that new herbicide to be the lifesaver. We're going to have to put it in a system that's diverse, that has other herbicide modes of action, that has other management practices that are helping us with our, uh, helping us with our weed problems already. <coughs> and we're also going to need to consider uh, things like nozzles, our neighbors, all that type of stuff so we can protect and keep this technology. Uh, cover crops, it really helps us with weed control. In no-till, it helps us maintain our no-till. It increases soil health. It has a lot of positive aspects to it. Uh, new technologies increase our flexibility. Uh, like I said, we can wait until after planting to terminate, which is a big deal. Um, they can be, those uh, legume cover crops can be difficult to terminate with just glyphosate alone, so having either one of those Kind of technology in there really brings a lot of flexibility in your termination and uh, most importantly you need to manage them like a pre-herbicide you need to manage your crop specifically you need to manage it for the crop that you're going to plant into and i think with that we'll uh, wrap up about everything that i have to say we have to take any questions for either one of us preferably dr stucker <laughs> <laughs> yeah before y'all leave the sign up sheets are in the back uh, back there chase here what's your plan um, which one? In general. For us, the middle of October, we have a Hessian fly free day, uh, October 15th. That's about when we shoot for for everything because so much of our stuff has weed in it. So we like to go for about the middle of October. You can get a little bit more biomass if you go earlier than that, but it's bad IPM in general. The reason I ask, when you mentioned the Irish, dry fall I question how good a stand will get but well see this year for us we were we were worked up and ready to go and it rained said we had about four inches of dust and is in that the tail end of that hurricane came through okay and I, that field's been underwater for three months but so, well, as a general rule about the middle of October yeah. we can do it. see and that's what I thought I was just I was all yes, I find it extremely hard to believe you had uniform emergence with cotton when you plant in, into three foot tall beds 14 days after planting. Man, I mean, what, did you see any emergence issues with the cotton, or did you just lay there and wait till the? As much as I would like to claim that, he had Matthew Wiggins worked on cover crops before me. They spent about three years learning how to run a planter for a cover crop that was hit this, this tall. We're pretty good at it. I mean, so it's the planting technique then. That like you have to pull the row cleaners. You have to have the weight. You know, so y'all like strip tilling through the the bio we're planting straight in. We're planting straight into it. We're not um, not putting the pinchers like to close the trench. Um, we're making sure those aren't overly hard, and we still got very good standing cotton. You need to do a presentation on that. Yeah, we we really struggled, like to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but we can we can do the same <laughs> with beans also. But it, I mean, I've had a hard enough time doing it with beans in the past. I couldn't imagine doing it. Yeah, we tried to do it a number of different ways. We've done it. We got a sprayer set up on an RTK rig, and we actually uh, burned down way early with a 10 inch band. Uh, you know, February, and then come back and overspray the whole thing. That's really worked slick. Uh, you don't really have to have your planter. Set. Do y'all roll much of it green and then spray? Uh, I've been doing some of that for my dissertation. 
We've been trying to see if you could use just a roller or if you still need to roll it in and spray it. Or, 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 well, it depends on probably your climate and everything. But once, basically, once it starts flowering, you can get a, you can, you're pretty close to being able to get away with rolling it. But what I've seen is where it will spray, then rolls, it's it worth a crap. If you will roll it green where you're breaking it, you will then spray it, you'll get a much better um, result. What, what, and that's very limited, what I've seen. Well, but, but I've seen some that was uh, sprayed, then rolled, and it was a disaster. By that same token, we, uh, so Harry Vance, like I said, we'll have trouble killing it. Just, it just round up, you can spray it, wait 21 days, it'll kind of turn a little yellow. But if you spray it and run a planter through it, especially a 30 inch planter through it, you'll smoke it. So there's something going on there. Sure, sure. We're working on it a little bit, but it's not just. Definitely more than just herbicide killing. Okay. Jason, another question. On those, you showed Matthew stuff with the warrant in it. How do those, your warrant, new residual, years, any of those, how are those working on top of that? Or how are they performing when you lay it down right on top of that? And that test that, that we had this year, they performed excellent. I, I would kind of expect it to be caught up some, but it did very well. We were spraying Valor seven days ahead of planting onto a cover crop and not getting caught injury and never putting down a clean up a four inch weed out of the country. When did you have rain for them? I could buy the valor, but the, the other ones I would think very fine. It was it wasn't the right rainfall for the valor to kill the cotton. I don't remember what it was, but it, I remember yeah, thinking I, we didn't get that right. I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> All right, y'all. We appreciate the interaction. So.